Uh, so, okay, uh, moving straight on to the next speaker, I'm going to introduce Oliver to you. Oliver Harrison. Oliver uh, is a, a 20 year old third year student, is that right, here at St Andrews. Uh, uh, joint Honours Economics and International Relations major. Good. Check a few out. Uh, Oliver has always been interested in the subject of marriage and union. Are you married? Definitely no. Uh, how do people choose a partner and commit to a lifetime of devotion? Uh, does destiny actually exist? Oliver's parents have been in an exclusive union for over 30 years. Um, I'm saying that because it's here, I don't know them. Uh, I'm not making assumptions. Why have they succeeded where other unions have failed in divorce? Yes, Oliver, why have they? Does religion fossilise or bump heads with our human sexual nature? Monogamy is a relatively recent artificial invention of human construct. What does that entail for relationships today when our life expectancy is now twice as long as humans when these ideals were created? I'm fascinated already. Here's all of them. Yeah, my name is Oliver Harrison, I'm 20 years old, and no, Gavin, I'm not married. But I am going to talk to you about the outdated ideals of marriage today. Um, what are the secrets to sustaining desire in the long run? Why does sex so often fade, even for couples that love each other as much as ever? Why is the forbidden so attractive? And why does intimacy not guarantee good sex or lasting marriage? Till death do his part is a compelling idea, but the fact of the matter is, is that the divorce rate is exceeding 50% in the developed world. And humans are increasingly likely to believe that non-monogamy is both biological, that we are inclined both biologically and innately to be non-monogamous. In the mid-19th century, Charles Darwin developed a new thesis about our evolutionary history, and it turns out he was wrong. According to anthropologist Thomas Huxley, we aren't really, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Um, he was wrong. We aren't related to apes. According to anthropologist Thomas Huxley, we are apes. We're more closely related to the chimp and the bonobo than the African elephant is related to the Indian elephant. We're more closely related to the chimp and the bonobo than the chimp and the bonobo are related to other primates, um, orangutans, gibbons, gorillas, amongst others. However, a standard narrative of human sexual evolution, along with the help of religious doctrines, describes a human nature where men have least women's reproductive potential by providing them with certain goods and services, generally those of um, generally, you know, protection, status, and, um, sorry, protection, those of hunting, protection, status, shelter, and in exchange women have offered fidelity, or at least the promise of fidelity, innocence, and purity. This narrative couples men and women up in an oppositional relationship, which is presumably built right into your DNA. In fact, this exchange-based relationship is actually a socially constructed artifact of, ar of agriculture, which dates up to 12 to 10,000 years ago, which is only as recent as 5% of the history of the modern-day human species, which has been around for over 500,000 years. Before we proceed, it's important to say that in those times, human beings lived in what anthropologists called hunter-gatherer groups, and were characterized by what they also called fierce egalitarianism. Um, Hunter-gatherers did not only share things, they demanded that things be shared in order to survive. All these things that were supposedly being exchanged for women's fidelity were actually being shared widely. Much like us, our ancestors were promiscuous, but, that did, but I'm not saying that they were having sex with strangers. In fact, there were no strangers in a hunter-gatherer band, you wouldn't have known these people your entire life. Indeed, there were overlapping sexual relationships hunter-gatherers were probably having several sexual relationships ongoing simultaneously throughout their adult lives. However, anthropologists are not saying they didn't love the people they were having sex with, nor are they saying that there wasn't necessarily any emotional pair bonding either, simply that it wasn't sexually exclusive. Those of us who have chosen to be monogamous, my parents who have been monogamous and married for 25 years, and if anybody knows otherwise, you can keep it to yourselves. Um, however, I'm not criticizing monogamy, but asserting that our ancestors had the choice. Much like being a vegetarian, you can choose not to eat the bacon in the fridge, but that doesn't stop it from smelling delicious. Human females are the only species who are sexually available throughout their entire menstrual cycle. 
both postmenopausal or um, in comparison to female chimps who are only available 40% of their cycle and female bonobos 90%. So animals have sex, it's natural instinct, it's biology, but we're the only ones who have an erotic life, meaning that sexuality is transformed by the human imagination, says sexologue Esther Pearl. The average human has sex about a thousand times per lifetime, and we share that ratio with the chimp and the bonobo. However, we don't share with other primates, the gorilla, the orangutan, and the gibbon, who are more typical of mammals and have sex on average about 12 times per lifetime. Charles Darwin himself, besides being such a remarkable anthropologist, biologist, and naturalist, was also known to be quite the prude and didn't understand how these polygynous mating structures, a system in which a male has a relationship with more than one female, are estimated to occur in up to 90% of mammals with the exception of birds, meerkats, red foxes, and a few other monogamous pairs of animals who are themselves not always monogamously sexually exclusive either. So when did human, human monogamy come about? Some say monogamy is as old as Adam. In fact, it originated from the pagan religions that hold the norm today. However, monogamy and should be monogamy are not to be confused. Should be monogamy was not popular until 150 years ago, where the, the, sorry, the rise of Western feminism deemed polygamy both sinful and evil. In fact, polygyny, the same sexual nature held by 90% of mammals, um, has been the norm for human sexual behavior throughout the vast majority of our existence. So how have we differed from our past, and how has human sexuality evolved? Nowadays is the first time we're trying to experience sexual desirability in the long term. Not because we want to have 12 children and we know that most of them will survive, and not because it's a woman's natural duty to have children either. Today, sex is less so a duty and more so embedded in connection and pleasure, which are rooted in desire. So what sustains desire, and why is it so difficult to sustain it today? According to Pearl, it is because we have to reconcile two fundamental human needs. On the one hand, our need for security, predictability, safety, our need for dependability, our need for permanence, all these anchoring factors in our lives that we call home, where we do that, that define our comfort zone, where we feel most at ease, and an equally strong need for both men and women for mystery, for danger, for adventure, for risk, for the unknown, for the unexpected, for journey. So reconciling our need for adventure and our need for security in what we like to call a passionate marriage is both contradictory in terms, says Perel. Marriage was an economic institution in which you are given a partnership for life in terms of children, right of passage, social status, succession, land. But now in addition to all these things, I want you to be my best friend, my trusted confidant, my passionate lover, and we live twice as long. So we come to one person and we ask them to give us what an entire village used to provide. Um, give me belonging, continuity, identity, but at the same time give me transcendence, mystery, and all, all in one. Give me comfort, but give me edge. Give me familiarity, but give me novelty. Give me, um, sorry, give me predictability, but give me surprise. And we think it's a given. And we believe that toys, lingerie, and internet pornography are going to save us with that and do the trick. The crisis of desire is the crisis of the imagination. So how do we balance security with passion and surprise? What attracts us and keeps us coming for more? Surveys show that we find ourselves most attracted to our partner when she's away, when we're apart, when we reunite. Indeed, absence makes the heart grow fonder, where desire is rooted in longing. The other result of the survey show that we find ourselves most attracted to our partner when he's in his element, when she's doing something that she's passionate about, when we're out and other people are drawn to him, when I look at my partner radiant and confident, when he is self-sustaining and independent. So it's in that middle space, not when we're so far that we lose touch, and not when we're so close that we can't see anything but ourselves. But it's in that middle comfortable distance when this person that is already so known is momentarily elusive and mysterious. That's where lies this movement and energy that gravitates us towards each other. Mystery is not about traveling to new places, said Proust, but looking with new eyes. It's the ability and effort to stay open to new mysteries that are living right beside us. To once again quote Carol, we're the only ones who can make love for hours, who can have multiple orgasms and touch nobody, just because we can imagine it. 
We can hint at it and not even have to do it. The ability to imagine it as if it were happening and whilst it is happening is enough. So what sustains desire in erotic couples? Generally, you hear of couples wanting more sex, but what that generally means is that couples want better sex. To reconnect with that quality of aliveness that sex used to afford them or what they hoped sex would grant them. If you want to sustain desire, it's throughout that real dialectic piece, a balance where you have the security that empowers you to take risks. You have the security that empowers you to transcend your comfort zone, to experience mystery. Unfortunately, this peaceful coexistence has often been known to be unachievable in today's society, where both responsibility and desire clash. Are we then designed by nature to have varied sexual diets, to be sexual omnivores? When we take our evolutionary history as a stand, just because we lived a certain way in the past, notably as non-monogamous hunter-gatherers, doesn't mean that we have to live that way today. And I agree with that. But that entails that everyone has to respond to the modern world in the same way, notably through following the norm of shitty monogamy. However, our bodies have not evolved in the same way to meet these societal standards. Although we can survive on McDonald's happy meals every day, our bodies will eventually reject it. Similarly, we can survive practicing should be monogamy. However, biologically, it is inevitably unsustainable. Should be monogamy is unnatural to our biological instincts. What I'm arguing against is today's shame associated with, the des with desire. It's the idea that if you love your husband or your wife, but you're still attracted to other people, that means that there's a problem with you, that there's a problem with your partner, that there's a problem with your marriage. A lot of families are fractured because of these unrealistic expectations that are based upon this false vision of human sexuality. Given what we've assumed about modern sexual relationships, societies in southwestern China exercise what we would assume to be an unconventional sexual practice. Their society is entirely sexually autonomous, meaning that there is no shame associated with sexual behavior. Women have hundreds of partners, doesn't matter, nobody cares, nobody gossips, no judgments are made. When the woman becomes pregnant, the child is cared for by her, her brothers and her sisters, the biological father is a non-issue. On the other side of the planet, in the Amazon, there are many tribes that practice what is called partible paternity. Where anthropologists believe that these people believe that a fetus is made up of accumulated semen. So a woman who wants to have a child that is smart, funny, and strong wants to have sex with a smart man, a funny man, and a strong man <laughs> in order to get all these essences into the baby. And when the child is born, these men will come forward and acknowledge the paternity of the child. So paternity in a society is a team endeavor. So, so why do these examples of partible paternity and sexual autonomy matter? Edward Wilson says because human sexuality is first and foremost a bonding device, and only secondarily a tool for procreation. This matters because our evolved, sorry, this matters because our evolved sexuality is in conflict with the modern world, where quick, instant, and effortless technology has allowed us to see that the grass might be greener on the other side faster than ever before. Now with Facebook and Tinder, I have access to thousands of people's profiles and photos constantly causing me to question what else might be out there. We are reputed as the most civilized generation yet. However, we're plagued with the shortest attention span than any generation before. So how do we sustain desire in the long run? The contradictions between what we should feel and what we do feel generate a huge amount of unnecessary suffering. My hope is that a more accurate understanding of human sexuality will lead us to have a greater tolerance for ourselves for each other, and will lead us to have greater respect for unconventional relationships, like same-sex marriage and polyandrous unions, where a woman has multiple men to her, for instance. And it will finally put to rest the idea that men have some innate, instinctive right to monitor and control women's sexual behaviors and bodies. And when we do this, we will see that it's not only homosexuals who have to come out of the closet, and that we all have closets we have to come out of. And when we do come out of these closets, we will realize that the fight is not with each other, but with an outdated, archaic sense of human sexuality that conflates property rights with desire, that generates shame and confusion in places of empathy and understanding. As Christopher Ryan has said, it's time we move beyond the idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus 
because the truth is that men are from Earth and women are too. Thank you.